All right, guys, let's go ahead and continue on with the uh, tracheostomy. Again, I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I can't talk. I use up a lot of air when I talk, so I get short of breath. <laughs> so um, I just need that little break. I'm still trying to recover over a uh, flu. Okay, so tracheostomy. <clears throat> a tracheostomy, okay, again, trachea, right? What's a stoma? Opening. An artificial opening that's been created. Okay, so here a surgical opening has been created to relieve respiratory distress caused by an obstruction of the upper airway. So you've got two sections of your airway. You've got your upper airway, which is kind of middle of your neck up, okay, to your nose and your mouth. That's upper airway. Lower airway is anything below that. So now you're talking about your trachea, your bronchus, the, the, the minor bronchuses, and then you've got your, uh, your, your lungs and then the air sacs in there, okay? So, your upper airway. An artificial creation is gonna be, uh, gonna be made underneath the upper respiratory system, okay? This may be due because of a traumatic injury to the upper respiratory part of it. They may be paralyzed so they can't breathe on their own. They may be unconscious and not breathing on their own, or a disease that interferes with the breathing mechanism. So they'll make an incision, they'll open it up, and they'll make another incision at the trachea. Now two things can happen here is they can either just um, let it heal on its own with an opening in there, or they will also artificially implant a plastic tubing in there within that stoma so that when they connect another tubing in there, it'll be a good tight fit. Okay, so two things can happen. They either just leave the opening or put an artificial tubing inside itself. So when you put the uh, mechanical respirator in, it'll attach nice and snug. Okay? <clears throat> so the tube that you would place in there, okay, this would be called a tracheostomy tube. It can either be plastic or metal and held into place by cuff, ties, and tape. So one end goes down the trachea, and then they will either just leave this alone so they can probably breathe on their own, and if they can't breathe on their own, then they'll be hooked up on the mechanical ventilator. Okay, but it just bypasses the upper respiratory part, so at least air is going in and out. Okay, so there's always a flow of air going in through <coughs> this stoma and into the tubing, okay? Now, when they have one of these things down the throat, patients are fearful because, first of all, they're unable to speak. This is around their voice box, so they're unable to speak formally. And it always feels like they're gonna choke. So it has that constant feeling of somebody having their hand around your throat. <clears throat> okay, mechanical ventilators. Mechanical ventilators, so now we're creating two ways two ways in which a patient can be assisted in their breathing. One would be to create an artificial opening through, through the throat into the trachea. The other one would be to actually put an apparatus down their throat and into their trachea. Okay? And then we'll hook them up on a mechanical ventilator. Now, this method, the tube that's going to go down here is known as an ET tube. Have you heard of that before? <coughs> ET2, which stands for endo, meaning within or inside, an endotracheal tube. Okay? They will have one of these tubes inserted down their endotrachea. They use this little tool known as the laryngoscope. Okay? Essentially, what they do is they shove this little end down your throat. They'll apply pressure. See, Okay, so here's a little wedge that goes down the throat. Then what the doctor will do is he will lift it up so it'll cause the trachea to open up a little bit wider. That will allow them for the insertion of this tubing for proper placement. Okay. Remember, you got two pipes going down. This allows them to see where they're placing that tube. 
okay? So once you get the opening, then they'll slide the endotracheal tube down the throat, and, and it's, it's gonna set right where, okay, you've got your trachea coming down, and then it splits up into what? Two bronchi. Okay, two bronchi, you got your left and your right. Okay, so the tube is gonna be placed right above where the trachea splits into the left and right bronchi. I like to say bronchuses. I just make up my own word. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is placed for someone who may have a pulmonary emboli. Someone who has a severe respiratory disease. Or someone who's not perfusing good on their own. Remember we want a 97% of veteran saturation, right? These are guys who have like saturations below 80. I mean, it is, it is deadly. It is gravely dangerous at this time. We may also place it on patients who have uh, a stroke, a CVA. Someone who may have guillain barre syndrome, which also affects their breathing mechanism, for example. Okay? Okay. So, let me just show you something real quick before we continue on here. So, when, damn it, this is the wrong one. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna do a, a hand drawing then. I'm gonna draw the a lung. Okay, so this is a one of the lungs. Okay. Surrounding the lung, you have a lining. That one lining is known as the visceral pleura. Okay, so here's the lung, and you have a lining around the there's a lining called the visceral pleura. There's two linings. Now you have an outside lining. And this is known as the parietal pleura. Parietal pleura. The space in between the two linings is a cavity. And this is known as the pleural cavity. Have you guys heard that before? Pleural cavity. And with this, within this pleural cavity is fluid, very labricious. It keeps the lungs lubricated so there is no friction when you're breathing. It keeps it very lubricated. You follow? All right. Now, I'm going to talk about different conditions of the lungs. Remember that the outside atmospheric pressure is a lot stronger than your pleural pressure. Okay? The outside pressure is stronger than the pleural pressure. You guys following? Let's say your patient gets into an accident, gets some rib injury. So they break a rib, and the rib punctures the lung. So now you have a break in the parietal pleura. You guys following? <clears throat> the outside atmospheric air is going to come in through this opening that was created by the fracture and remember, the atmospheric air is stronger, so with all this atmospheric <coughs> pressure coming in, what is the, what's gonna happen to the lungs? Collapse. It's gonna collapse, okay? That is known as atelectasis, atelectasis or collapsed lung. It is known as an atelectasis or a collapsed lung. Okay, so that's the condition. The cause of it, the cause of air going into pleural cavity, that is known as pneumothorax. So air into the pleural cavity is known as pneumothorax, which causes atelectasis. Okay. 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 Everybody got that? Now. Other things can flow in there. So if blood goes into there, hemothorax. it's known as hemothorax. 
If you get blood in the pleural cavity, it's known as hemothorax. And any other type of fluids is known as pleural effusion. Any other fluids other than blood in the pleural cavity is known as pleural effusion. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Anytime you have extra fluids or extra blood in there because it's going around the lungs, it also makes it difficult to breathe. It may not cause a collapsed lung, but now there's more contents around that lung causing it, causing difficulty for your lungs to expand. Okay, any questions? What happened to my camera? So here's your trachea. It's going to break up into your right and left bronchus. This is the right side, so this is going to be the right. The bronchus is going to come this way, and the left is going to go somewhat like this. Okay, so here's your right, here's your left. Your endotracheal tube, your endotracheal tube should be placed <coughs> right above the right and left bronchi. This area is known as the carina. That is where the tip of the ET tube should be placed, right above the carina. Okay. So now when air is getting pushed in by mechanical ventilation, air is going to go in into the right and left lungs evenly. Okay? Everybody got that? That's how it should be. Now, let's say the tip of the catheter gets pushed too far. If they keep pushing that catheter in, this endotube, <coughs> endotracheal tube, which way is it going to go? Is it going to want to go to the left or to the right side? Right. Why the right? Because it's at a lesser angle. Okay, exactly. The right is more vertical, so it's going to want to go here. Okay? This is more horizontal, so it's going to take the path of least resistance. It's going to want to go to the right side. Now, when that happens, this becomes aerated, so now you're getting all your oxygen over here. But you're not getting any oxygen over here. You guys with me so far? So only the right side is getting aerated, the left side isn't. What do you think is going to happen to the left lung? It collapses. It collapses. What's that called? When you have lung collapse, it's known as atelectasis. Okay, this one's atelectasis. Now let's look at the opposite extreme. Okay, so now you have the tube down here. What happens if the tube of the tip ends up up here? Okay, what's up there? You've got two pipes. You've got your windpipe and you've got your what? Esophagus. You've got your esophagus, okay, your windpipe. So air is coming down here. Where else is air going? Stomach. Down the esophagus and it's going to cause what? Gastric distension. Okay, gastric distension. Okay. Is the patient <coughs> being properly aerated? Mm -mm. No. They're getting aerated, but not efficiently. 
Yeah. So again, they are going to get deprived of oxygen. They're getting oxygen, but not enough. All right. So those are your two worst case scenarios. Now, when a patient gets an endotracheal tube, what are we going to do to assure proper placement? Chest x-ray. A chest x-ray. Just like everything else. So we're going to do a chest x-ray for ET tube placement. And the tip of the catheter should be right above the carina. Okay. So if you guys have your x-ray eyes, when you use your x-ray your eyes, you can see the trachea. See it? And it branches it's darker. Right you guys see it? And it branches mm -hmm. right there. Here's your trachea, and then you see it splitting up into the two. You have the right, here's the right, and here's the left main bronchi. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. All right, so the, the tube should be placed right about here. So, again, if it's too low, the catheter, the, the tube is going to go down the right side. It's going to cause the left lung collapse. <coughs> If it's too high, <coughs> yes, you're getting aerated, but so is your stomach. Okay. If you do get a left lung collapse, are they able to pull out the tube a little bit so that it fixes it? Oh, absolutely, it, that, yeah. Okay. So once, yeah, so if it's in the wrong place, they'll readjust it, and hopefully it'll. But like once the lung collapses, it should re okay. be able to aerate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions here? <coughs> All right. Okay, let's talk about, so to get the tubes down, two ways, you got tracheostomy or an ND, endotracheal tube. We're gonna hook them up to a machine, a ventilator, that will help the patient breathe. This mechanical ventilator is known as a positive pressure ventilation. Positive pressure ventilation. Without going through this, I'm going to explain exactly what it is. They're hooked up to this mechanical ventilator. So it's going to, it's going to um, regulate the respiration. Remember, 15 to 20 is normal for adults, right? So we can regulate the respiration. We can also regulate the concentration of oxygen going into the lungs. Now, this mechanical ventilator activates only for inspiration. So when it kicks in, air gets pushed in into the lungs. You guys follow? It activates, air gets inflated. It shuts off and automatically, on its own, will recoil back to its shape on its own. You got it? So on inhalation, off exhalation, in, okay, out. Off, I mean on, off, on, off, on, off, okay? So it, it's only on or activated when it's pushing air in. When you're breathing out, your body's doing it on its own through recoiling or um, bouncing back to its original shape. That's positive ventilation. Positive means we're putting something in. Positive ventilation, we're putting air in. Okay. Negative ventilation. It still happens. Okay. Negative ventilation. This is called, also known as the iron lung. Happens with uh, again those who have lung problems. It was used almost predominantly with those who had polio. Okay. You have a patient that goes gets put in into <coughs> a uh, hyperbaric chamber. It's a vacuum chamber. So they're inside this chamber. The only thing that's sticking out is their head. Good thing about this here is that they don't have to have any tubes down their throat or in their nose to help them breathe. Essentially what this is, it's called negative ventilation, okay? So all this air gets sucked out. It's negative, so we're taking air out. When air gets <coughs> taken out, Everything within that chamber becomes compressed, okay? Because you're sucking things out. Have you guys ever seen the um, the vacuum bag? Mm -hmm. You know, 
you guys know what I'm talking about, the vacuum bag? You put like your, your comforters, your sweater or whatever oh. that you're not using for that season. You hook it up to the vacuum and the vacuum is sucking all the air out, right? And all the contents become compressed. Okay. Now, what would happen if I opened up that flap to let back the air in? It's going to what? Expand. So when the negative ventilation is active, it sucks air out, it turns off, and it allows the lungs to expand. Activate it, air out. Off, lungs expand. It's just the opposite of positive ventilation. So it does expiration for you, right? Right. Is it like constantly they do it, or they do it like one time? No, it's constant. It's constant, just just like just like the other one. This is this. They're breathing on their own, but their lungs are weak, so they're they're helping them out with respiration by negative means. So the and maybe the re so it's the reason why they put them in the iron lung instead of using the other one is so that they can continue to talk and exactly okay. and and also again they're they're probably breathing on their own. It's effective. It's just their lungs are probably weak. So we're helping them out, retraining them. It retrains them too. Okay. Then we got here chest tube and drainage. Re remember pneumothorax, hemothorax. All right. So we need to get the lungs back into normal condition. So we're either gonna remove that atmospheric air out of there, or we're gonna remove any of the heme that's in the pleural cavity, or pleural effusion that's in the pleural cavity. So we'll put a chest tube in there. Okay. Chest tube and drainage, pressure in the pleural cavity is normally lower than atmospheric pressure, but disease or injury can alter this, okay? We talked about that earlier. So what we'll do here is we will put in a chest tube, like so, okay? We are gonna form an artificial opening known as a uh, thoracotomy, thoracotomy for thorax, okay? Omi. Okay, again, an artificial opening. So we're gonna go through the chest wall, put the tube within the pleural cavity, and we're gonna aerate it. We're gonna put air back in there. Or we can also use it to drain any fluids in there, whether it be blood or any other type of fluids. Putting the heart, I'm um, putting the lungs back into normal status. Okay? This can also be done in radiology. Okay, any questions? Drainage tubes. Drainage tubes, again, remember if you have your patient who's had surgery, there may be a collection of fluid on that side, so what they'll do is they'll put a drainage uh, tube there to remove any excess buildup of secretions and fluids. These are usually put at wound and operative sites generally in areas where there is a large amount of tissue dissection or areas where there is increased blood supply. If placed in the abdomen, you guys remember these? Drainage tubes can be a Penrose, a Jackson Prac, or a Hemovac. It's a special type of um, uh, drainage tube. This is actually a Hemovac right here. So the tube has been inserted at the wound and they hook it up to a canister that has already been vacuumed. It has negative pressure. So when it's hooked up, it's gonna suck anything out of the wound and into, into the canister. This is actually, this is your hemovac. Okay. You may also run into something what's known as a T-tube. We see this a lot in radiology as a T-tube. We're looking at this right here, okay? So here is your abdominal wall. Within your abdominal wall inside is where we used to be the, 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 the gallbladder, okay? Let's go back here real quick. Cholecystectomy. What is a cholecyst? In gallbladder? Okay, yeah. Gallbladder. Removal. So someone who's had a cholecystectomy, they've had their gallbladder removed. What is the whole purpose of the gallbladder? Store the bile. Or is everybody listening? It stores the bile being produced from where? The liver. The liver. Okay. It's, like, it's just a storage. It's a bladder to store <clears throat> bile. 
Now, if we remove that, is bile still being produced? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? So bile is still being produced, and we want to make sure that the vessel that connects from the liver to the small bowel is still open and patent. Because you go in there and remove the, uh, the gallbladder, there are chances that you may have caused damage to that main vessel that goes from the liver and into the small bowel for continuous drainage of that bile. So what they'll do in, in surgery is they'll leave a rubber tubing in the common bile duct, okay? Because this is where the liver is. This is where the gallbladder used to be. And then the tip of that vessel ends up in the small bowel. This is how the bile drains. So what they'll do is they'll put a rubber tubing in there to make sure that the common bile duct remains open. You follow me so far? Two days later, okay, what we'll do is we will inject contrast through the other end of the tubing, through here, fill up the bile duct and see if it's open. And there was no co uh, damage caused by that cholecystectomy. And if we see the entire vessel, we're just gonna boop, pull it out. Put a bandage on and go home. That's it. Okay, so you're gonna see a lot of these T-tubes in radiography. The other one here is gastric and intestinal um, drainage, different tubes. We've already reviewed this under Levine's sump and canter. Okay, so what I want you to get out of this is that um, drainage tubes are usually found at operative sites. <laughs> operative sites and wounds. Operative sites and wounds. <clears throat> Most common for us in the abdominal area. Most common for us in the abdominal area. Okay, any questions? Yes? They use the rubber tubing for a laparoscopic as well. Even with laparoscopic, you may leave a tube in there, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. they do that. I asked because I had that done when I was 22. And they didn't? I never had a problem. Yeah, they may or may not. It's, it's not yeah. always It's not always positive. My sister had laparoscopic, yeah. but they left a the T-tube in her. Yeah. Yeah, they never even had any follow-up. Yeah, you were 22 when it happened? Yeah. Yeah, she was 24. Yeah. Get younger and younger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions? Are we done here? Okay, what's going on next week?